here with Jules Delille of the Member School, and we are talking today about symbolic kinship and the limits of anthropology. Although I think we're actually going to get into the limits of broader social sciences. Uh, Jules is a human behavioral ecologist, which is a big way of saying works in a lot of different social sciences and doesn't really trust them, yeah. and also a nurse. Um, so, Jules, I I uh, audited your class on symbolic kinship for um, member school a couple months ago. Went back through the videos of that of that course and. I have also been kind of critical of Marxist sociological thinking. Um, and I know there are Marxists out there who go, we don't do sociology. We do the objective science of Marxism, whatever the fuck that is. Um, but in general, most sociology has, you know, kind of four origins, you know, kind of, Durkheimian positivism, Comtean positivism. And then the other two origins are like German historical school and then German historical school slash also quasi Marxist um, in terms of Sombart and Weber. And, uh, and so I have been very distrustful of those categories because I have just enough anthropological training to know that talking about everything purely in in modes of production and classes related to modes of production actually does not deal with the fact that for the great majority of human cultures both currently existing and that we know of in the past familial and kinship organizations um are the way people understand themselves in quote modes of production um and in fact i think most things that extend you know uh most other social forms be they tribe race nation ex uh, to some degree even class are many ways kinds of extensions of ideas of kinships abstracted out at various levels of of kind of degree so far from most human reckoning traditionally that they're not recognizable as as kind of kinship metaphors although it shows up in our language around them all the time um yeah that's actually I mean, one of the things that people think is what distinguishes humans from other primates and and one of the focuses of like speculative neurology and evolution is like ontologization like when did kinship categories and actually differentiating like mother father brother sister and then like you know like uterine cousin or other things like as you're expanding these categories farther and farther outward is that actually the foundation for all linguistic development neurologically so like what like that's one of the things that we'll get into in my human origins class when we actually started talking about like encephalization and, and structural changes. Like people think that that's essential to all linguistic determination, which I, I think is, I think that that's like a big deal because we, we take language for granted. And some people even argue about whether or not it's a technology though, though we do kind of see it as being a quality, which is uniquely human. And, and that's imp that's important to sociology that's descended from like European enlightenment, right? It's the idea that humans are unique in our ability to reason and to act against our base urges and to make choices for the greater good, right? That's that's one of our fundamental assumptions in modern liberalism, um, and and all of the data pretty much destroys that. So it's, it's, a, it's a sad place <laughs> um, to be if you're a social scientist that like truly believes in like liberalism and democracy and inherits this genealogy and then is confronted with the way that things actually are, which is far, far messier than the theories that are presented. So yeah, like I'm, I'm distrustful of all of the social and behavioral sciences, but I also feel like um, there's a big language game happening that's kind of like concealing concealing a, a widespread reductionism 
that is just like it's not good enough i just that, i think that that's my fundamental problem with it it's it's not good enough if we want to call it science and say that it's rigorous and make these universal determinations from it yeah you and i were talking off air about um problems that we both have with over aggr uh, aggregation or over quantification of things that imposing a quantitative scale on is often how do I say it? Um, bullshit. Uh, like, like the, like effectively it's arbitrary what we're including in this quantitative scale or not. And I know I, there's a lot of physicists and, and stuff in my audience and they get mad when I, when I go in these rants, but I'm like a lot of times when we look at like, say sociological research, or it's even worse than educational research, we are taking numbers and not, uh, dealing with their origin. So one of the things that people know this about is like the IQ test. And we all like, it's this common thing on the, on the left, but I, I'm also like, this is, these problems are true for a whole lot of educational rubrics that you're not questioning. Um, and I don't just mean standardized tests either. There's like, um, measures of behavior, supposed like qualitative behavioral, observations and you and I have even both done them and then you look at you look at what they're asking you to do and it's like rate this child's behavior on a scale of one to six rate this teacher's behavior on a scale of one to a hundred and that rating is effectively arbitrary um I, I deal with this serious Go ahead. consequences like mm -hmm. the, the, that's the thing it's like I, I my my problem is not just with the fact that our data in being stripped of its context isn't as good as it could be. Like my perfectionist side cares about that a lot because I do want to be the dutiful little scientist who does the best iterating towards the truth ever, knowing I will never reach that horizon because it's like the scientific utopia. Um, you know, like there, there, there is a part of me that has that drive. Um, but I think it's the real consequences that come from aggregating data, stripping it of its context, and then giving the power, giving people the power to make these arbitrary designations as if they are objective observers. And this is one of like my biggest problems with, you know, being in, like doing bedside nursing and interacting with patients, working with other healthcare providers. And, but I'll, just in the history of my research, I've done, I've done nursing research, I've done sociological research, I interviewed gamers about piracy and other things mm -hmm. like that um, at different stages. So like I've, I've had a lot of different interactions with people in interview formats and the conclusions that are kind of like always made by these studies are basically that we need more resources for more education in order to explore these issues further when like the data that you actually get from being on the floor and interacting with these people is that they're suffering and that these like policy conclusions and decisions are just like completely divorced from simple solutions that could exist in their daily context that there's this like you know leviathan of bureaucracy and nonsense in between the person and us the you know the agents of the bureaucracy it's like sorry can't help you with that uh, can only write down one through 10 on the chart, rate your pain, right? So like there, there's, there's something dissatisfying with seeing humanity and experiencing humanity while your empathy isn't crushed in those contexts because you like care about those people. But it also just like the, the dutiful little scientist in me, like we could do better research design and we could be better materialists by taking into account these very difficult to, you know, these, these very difficult to make objective and numerical qualities. So like, I always go on this spiel about how like IQ, um, BMI, GDP, all of these things are like completely made up and they don't actually say anything about how a person is properly provisioned. So I, I like to talk about embodied wealth and that, that's actually like a human behavioral ecology concept that a lot of the really quantitative um, scientists aren't very fond of because it deals with a lot of, it deals with things that are difficult to quantify like skills, 
experiences, knowledge of the environment, um, you know, competence, physical competence, your ability to balance on a precipice, those sorts of things that you can't really like plug that into a spreadsheet and um, decide whether or not your investment in an individual is worth it based on that. And that's, that's, I think my big problem with the ultimate outcome of social and behavioral science research is that it, it reduces what we could be doing for each other to kind of like uh, what kind of material inputs would be most efficient. This is where you get into kind of like the, um, like, um, altruism ideas, right? Like the most efficient forms of economic altruism, instead of looking at people on the level of the human and actually listening to them tell you what they need, which is like, I think that that's, we're doing kickflips and very complicated, highly funded research to not actually listen to people or make their lives better most of the time. So I, I just, in terms of wasting human energy, while the climate is dying, I really think we could be spending our time doing better things. What I think is interesting about that um, is that people are going to hear those two questions and not see how they're related, right? So one of the things that, one of the points here is we are dealing with abstractions that seem to tell us something. And they might tell us something, but like we talk about class. Class does tell us something. Um, but when we, when we talk about the way humans are actually organized, um, and organized in ways that are highly varied, but, but in our language, almost universal, right? Like, I can't tell you that there is one primary type of kin relation that, that, that dominates, all human subgroups going back for what we have data for. Uh, there isn't. But I can tell you that I can't find a society that doesn't have a concept of kin relation. That literally cannot find one. Like, I've never seen anyone say there's any evidence that there is one. Um, all people, all people are related to other people somehow. And that's the thing. It's like, we our problem with the way that we approach kinship is that we also we often use it as like a coefficient for degrees of biological relatedness right mm -hmm. how many genes you actually share um and whether or not the concept of genes is ever in the mix for people there are tons of cultures that are extremely successful and have continue to cross centuries without knowing what a DNA helix looks like. It doesn't matter to them at all. Um, the concept is some kind of shared substance. Like that's really what kinship is. And um, if we stop thinking about the shared substance as being genes and start thinking about it as food or air or other, other substances that are important to different peoples, it helps us kind of like it helps us realize what is actually happening in a way that's more satisfying than kinship diagrams, circles, triangles, dotted lines, straight lines. Like we've all, we've all seen the kinship tree, especially in the context of like European nobility. And I think that's the problem is that we have a language of kinship and we utilize this explanation of kinship within anthropology that's basically taking um, the propaganda of very inbred Habsburgs and their claims to legitimacy and using that to create kind of like a structured systematic language that we then impose on other people when how people are relating what they're sharing, what their duties and their obligations really are is not following the lines of that kinship diagram. So like we're, we're missing a lot in this kind of objectification of exactly what it takes to make you and someone else of the same substance. And I, I guess this is another thing that's maybe hard for people from Western educated, industrialized, rich democracies to think about. So this is, this is another concept that I use that's really important is weird societies. Um, like 
the best way to put it, I think, is that, um, you know, the United States, um, Denmark, you know, Sweden, England, France, it, it, it doesn't matter. Like these societies occupy the extreme end of distributions. And so they're kind of like the worst subpopulations that you could study for generalizing about homo sapiens. Uh, the vast majority of human history, we didn't live like this. We didn't conduct ourselves like this. Like none of this was a fundamental component of um, how we organized ourselves. And we are coming from an idea of individuality and separateness. Uh, the, and, and it's kind of reinforced in psychoanalysis and in the legacy of Freud. So everybody, you kind of get it from all angles growing up. It's, it's almost impossible to avoid. Mm -hmm. um, but when, like, when it comes down to it, we think about individuals. We think about you ending at the edges of your skin. When in the vast majority of cultures, a person is also sometimes their ancestors and a lot of other things all at once. So they, they're actually not individuals. They are individual persons. They are multiplicities. Um, and Salins is actually my favorite anthropologist to bring up for this. And he's, you know, a contrarian within anthropology. He kind of picked fights his entire career um, and tended to um, pick up theoretical lines with other contrarians. So like he and Graeber wrote on Kings, which is one of my favorite Graeber texts actually because of how he kind of reels in Graeber's bong rips. But um, uh, I, I really like talking about the idea of people that are the composite sites of identities and of investments because I don't exist in just one family tree. And most people don't either, but we do have this kind of weird idea about like patrilineal society patrilineal descent, you know, like I get my dad's name, I inherit his land. And we project that idea really deep into the past um, when people might not have had those ideas at all. And like, yeah, you probably have a strong relationship with your mother because she carried you and gave birth to you and lactated in order for you to survive, or at least coordinated the provisioning of that amongst her relatives. But um, you also have strong investments from other people that might not have given you any genetics at all. And that's like my favorite example of this is uh, Amazonian partable paternity. Do you know about this? No, I don't. OK, so in the Amazon, um, when in, in, in certain societies, it's not across all Amazonian indigenous cultures, but it's pretty common. Um, when a woman becomes pregnant, the general belief is that a certain amount of sperm is necessary in order to complete that pregnancy. And so she will like make connections with other male members in the community and beyond everyone investing sperm in the child and therefore having a ritual and spiritual obligation to that child across the course of their life. So everybody's like a dad. And so like you could, you could a family in a lot of Amazonian cultures is one mom uh, her kid and maybe eight to 14 dads, depending. And they all bring ritual gifts and bring food and help support. And it's just a way that everyone is invested in everyone within the community. And when you look at like humans who do things like this and you, you kind of question, well, like what's the outcome for the children? It seems to be significantly better than in a lot of circumstances where they don't have so many individuals investing in them where there isn't that sense of collective responsibility. So um, the substance doesn't matter as much as the reciprocal rights and duties that, that come with that relationship. And sometimes it's cool to be, you know, a ritual dad and to show up at a ceremony for your kid as they're growing up and to bring what's necessary in order to provision them. So there's like a, there's a satisfaction that comes from that that isn't, necessarily explainable in the cold objective language of return on investment either so that that's that's another failing of anthropology and sociology in trying to figure out exactly like what the obstacles are to the success of these relationships in western societies i think that we often say well there's financial strain there are economic problems um and there are undoubtedly and kinship organizations solve a lot of problems. So if, if we're having economic uh, 
and material flow problems, then we're probably also having kinship problems that aren't being addressed. And I, I see that in my peers, like in my own experience, I don't, I don't know anyone who has access to elders with their experience and <laughs> their wisdom. Um, I don't know any of my peers who have kids who have access to the right amount of childcare. Um, I, I think that we definitely aren't getting the kinds of social supports and interactions from each other that we want. And we, we talk about these as political problems. We talk about these as economic problems. We don't talk about them as problems of kinship. Right. So one of my big uh, pushes lately is to get people to realize if you're going to talk about modes of production, even remotely balanced, if you want to use Marxist phraseology, we have to talk about modes of reproduction because I set up, quote, relationships of production, because most relationships of production, having to put all this in the proper Marxological quotation marks, because I'm not, I'm not sure that these phrases help you, but I am sure that if you're going to use them, you could use them more responsibly than we do. Um really are driven by kinship values. And I realized that even before I read Marshall's uh, song, and he was funny, you mentioned him, um, you know, his, what kinship is and what it isn't. That book really helped me articulate this, but I'd had this insight for a long time where I'm like, seems to me as someone who has, you know, undergraduate level anthropology work, admittedly not a specialist in it, never claimed to be an anthropologist, don't want to be an anthropologist, have critiques of the whole field, but... I mean, me neither. <laughs> um, but, and not and not just that it comes out of colonialism, although that is part of it, um, it seems to me that there's there is very little Marxist writing on this outside of Ingalls's origins of the family book. Um, and Ingalls does kind of come to the right conclusion that like the family is probably the orientation of class. And he talks about the relationships of divisions of labor between men and women uh, being the first site of class origins. But then I sort of thought about that. And I was like, well, yeah, that's true enough. And he is realizing something, and he's realizing something early and with very sketchy inputs. I mean, we, we, the, the anthropology he's dealing with is really bad, actually. Um, but I realized, like, okay, if we take that seriously, we really should be looking at kinship connections. And that is a lot larger than just the biological family, as we just mentioned. Um, it's a lot larger than even just uh, it found family, the way we talk about this now, our, our, our imagined social family. I mean, people like who, fictive kinship. Right. We love that fictive kinship, especially when it's like related to a mythological character. I love it when entire cohorts of people start working cooperatively because they believe that they're descended from somebody from space or other things like that. There, there's amazing. There, like, what actually triggers the cohesion, like that coagulation of kinship? That seems to be arbitrary. It's it's that people want to link up and to form squads in this way, regardless of what the actual like flows of genetics are. Um, okay, so if you talk about modes of production, you mm -hmm. have to talk about modes of subsistence because mm -hmm. you cannot do work without a body that's full of food and energy, right? So like the metabolic realities, um, you know, Marxist materialists will talk about the cost of linen and then they'll kind of struggle to think about um, the metabolic costs of sociality. And, and that's the thing. Um, and this is kind of like one of my favorite things to point out to people. But like, if we're going to criticize the bourgeoisie for not being self-made, we need to recognize that literally no human being is self-made. Everyone is provisioned by a community, by their families. Um, and then they're, they're provisioned while they're doing this work. So um, it's, it's, yeah, Marx was recognizing that in order for the labor movement to actually function, that it was going to need this like uh, giant body of unpaid domestic labor in order to support it. And he no doubt experienced that in his own household, like the role, the roles of women 
form kind of like an interesting an interestingly weird lean in social theory because they like weren't quite ready to acknowledge that um division of labor along gender lines like it almost felt like it was essential to them so there is some determinism in marx and in the origins of anthropology and sociology that have to be confronted and it's nobody really wants to do it because you don't like you don't want to look back in the textbooks and be like hey i'm citing you know um robin fox the anthropologist who said that principle one women have children principle two men fertilize women principle three men have authority principle four primary kin do not copulate with each other you know like they, they're setting out these like deterministic um rules for engagement that like you know if, if you want to be progressive now you can't you can't say any of those things that's all like that's you know you'll get canceled for that but we're still citing these dudes in the social and behavioral sciences this is still like the this is the skeletal structure that underlies anthropological theory so um we've got big problems with that idea and especially because um if we're looking at biology, division of labor is actually far more likely like uh, something that's related to couple formation and maintaining monogamy than it probably has anything to do with, with class because that, that's when we look at primates that actually like are monogamous and have concerns about paternity, they stay together all the time, right? That pair bond is what ensures paternity. Um, and humans are, are kind of interesting in that like we're highly social. So having the division of labor is one of the ways in which it is made impossible for paternity or for infidelity to occur in different social contexts. So it's like that that's not something that comes up in Marxist way of thinking. They're not thinking about like couple formations or how babies are made when they're thinking about labor movements. They're, they're thinking about larger waves in social organization and so like th this is this is really a problem in scale i think um yeah i mean this really shows up for example in mao encountered some uh some groups uh of people in china who were very socially stable um and somewhat even socially uh socialistic and that they had shared forms of property uh they immediately tried to force the i think it's the miso i don't know how to say that correctly but it's m in transliterated into english for people who want to look it up it's m i s o u um but that's probably from pinion so i have no idea how to pronounce that um what that they immediately tried to impose the quote bourgeois family on them deliberately as a modernizing project because that's the only model they had and um this was this was imposed in almost all of the socialist countries, not even just the ones in the communist bloc um, to, even though, and like I, to, to do some defense of say the Bolsheviks, which I, they did not initially insist on this, but they really do enforce this later on. Hence a lot of the anti, the reversal of like the decriminalization of homosexuality and stuff like this is also done in all of these lines too. Um, and I think it's something that, uh, when people go, oh, that was just at the time. And I'm like, yeah, but ask yourself, why was this an inclination? Why was this assumed? Why were the social forms of bourgeois life assumed? And I, I realized that because I hit this wall. I'm a Christopher Lash fan. I agree with a, a lot of what he has to say, but when he writes on the family, he brings up all this this anthropology that literally actually ignores most of the anthropology that was happening in the 60s and 70s that 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 was critiquing the fact that the reason why all the family couple bondings that we looked at looked like the ones that we had normalized uh, in the developed West was because that's how we defined family and we only looked at those units for the definition and that was that was actually being critiqued at the time he was writing, but he was projecting this notion of a family all the way back in human culture. I mean, like in human culture, like period, like, like going like pre-capitalist even. Um, so, uh, 
the Marxist critics would just say, "Oh, well, you're you're just you're just confusing this time the bourgeois family was was projected onto um, uh, the working class family, and thus uh, you don't understand the points of family abolition." But fine, whatever. Uh, you also don't understand what kinship is, how fungible it is, and um, how these relations are highly varied from culture to culture, time to time, mode to mode. And again, I'm putting that in quotation marks. Um, well, yeah. And th so this is the problem with people who come out of Marx in the social and behavioral sciences. Marx is a unilineal cultural evolutionist. He believes in a progression of culture from a primitive primordial state towards civilization, right? This is, you know, this is Hegel. This is this is in kind of everything. There's this idea that we are moving towards a moment of perfection. They somehow managed to do this while also still having an idea of the fall and deterioration away from a more perfect period. So like, you know, cheers that you can pull that off at once. That must be the dialectic or something. But um, like the, the thing about that idea of progress from one state to the other is that we start to stage human organizations in the same way that we stage cultural progression, right? So you get the idea of the uh, primordial horde, right? The, the mm. first origin, the promiscuous horde in which you do not know who the fathers of your children are. There's no way to keep track because you're just doing whatever you want, right? And that's, that's what we associate with like hunter gatherers, for example, which is mm. clearly the earliest uh, organizational stage of humanity. And then you move through your, your nomadic people that have some form of paternity, but, you know, and eventually you'll end up with Lewis Henry Morgan's version of Oedipus, right? You get the nuclear family, the mommy, daddy, me. And mm -hmm. this is why like at member school, we've spent so much time dealing with psychoanalysis, dealing with like Deleuze and Guattari and going through these concepts of kinship and the ways that European philosophy has dealt with Marx's ideas about family. Um, so first of all, um, modes of subsistence or modes of production are not stages through which a Pokemon evolves. Like this is not how this works. You don't, you know, go through one stage to the next. Um, they are strategies that you can use at different times over a single life cycle and that cultures might use at interchangeably or at different times over the course of the year. So, so that's the thing. Some people do like horticulture and pastoralism. Uh, you know, some people do agriculturalism and then also will forage off the land and hunt for different periods of time. So we do ourselves a serious disservice to think that it goes like hunter gatherer you know, nomadic pastoralist, horticulturalist, agriculturalist, industrialist, because the truth is that industrialists are often have way shittier bones and have worse families and are under much more stress and are much worse provisioned than hunter gatherers are. So like, if, if you think that we go from um, nasty, brutish and short to, um, you know, truly civilized and safe and that modernity is the best it could ever be, then I'm sorry to disappoint you, but that's just a fundamental misunderstanding of how people live and do stuff. And this, this is the problem with reading the theory on the books as opposed to seeing how people actually live their lives. When you watch people adapt to exogenous shocks, you realize that the rules are not these hard lines. They're just, they're just strategies and people can change them as quickly as they can do anything else. Well, that's an important point. I mean, one of the things that shocked me when I was when I was in my twenties and first encountering anthropology was learning how bad the bone density decrease was for early agriculturalists, and it's like, and we have evidence of disease increase and um, just in general, like yes, you could sustain higher populations. There was a an increase in birth rate, but the quality of life for basically a thousand years or more drops dramatically. Um, yeah, it's terrific. Well, honestly, and this is why I need to get into 
an actual fist fight with Yuval Harari and Lee Phillips. And I honestly, I think I could take them both at one time because th these are both, there are narratives that both of them utilize that I really, really dislike. Uh, Yuval Harari presents in um, his homo, you know, series, the idea that we just made, we slowly made decisions and kind of sauntered vaguely downwards into agriculturalism because it just, it was just, it had more advantages than disadvantages. That's the way that he talks about it. And, and that, that, you know, he, humanity couldn't see these cumulative negative effects that were happening. I think Yuval Harari um, doesn't understand the history of people that were kidnapped and enslaved in order to be agriculturalists. So like agricultural um, sedentary strategies have been imposed on populations from the beginning of agriculture. Like we have historical texts and texts even older than that, including like Gilgamesh, right? Th things from early Assyrian periods that talk about entire communities being enslaved in order to grow grains. So um, people didn't just choose to grow grains and have bones that were made of dust and to be subjected to zoonotic diseases and to be raided by people on horseback. You know, like that's, that's not the choice that everybody was making just because it was like, Oh, we didn't see all this. So like there, there's a false narrative to the way that humanity has been ensnared by agriculture that Yuval Harari presents. And then like with Lee Phillips, for me, it's this idea of, progress towards the fully automated like luxury communist star trek utopia um because both of them completely suppress the idea of assimilation and this is what you talked about like when you impose the bourgeois family onto communities that have completely different kinship systems what you're doing is assimilating them into your institutional project, into your imperial paradigm. And when you split up families like that, everybody can be usable. They can be inserted into other cohorts that have already been socialized into these ideas. The people become much more easily exploitable. Um, and there is a reason why indigenous communities have resisted assimilation and have fought to maintain traditional kinship systems like grannies taking care of grandkids. Like this is a huge problem in Canada. Um, when the British came to Canada, they intentionally destroyed food systems. They intentionally separated children from their families so the children couldn't learn their food ways. They put them into residential schools. They gave them TB on purpose. They hid their bodies. Like And like this is a part of the colonial project that has existed since Rome. So that, that's one of the reasons why you'll actually see, see it like not just where European imperial and colonial powers have existed, but also where colonialism operates in other places in China and in the Incan empire, this happened. Like they take children and educate them very explicitly not to um, gain the foodways and the independence and the resilience of their indigenous communities. They want them assimilated into dependence and operation within larger social system. So, I mean, we, we see that kind of stuff, but we also like struggle to identify it, but it's, it's ancient. It's, it's not a capitalism problem. It's not a modernity problem. And I think that that's part of why the social and behavioral sciences also struggle to talk about it is because like, it is something that's much, much older than what we think of in terms of markets and economic pressures and, and laws regarding family organization as well. Yeah, so in one sense, it ends up being uh, kind of teleological to the point of eschatology. Yeah. In the other sense, it also is given to Lazarianism, like, like, okay, so there was a time when we were unalienated, now we are totally alienated, but we can't talk about why except in this, like, vague way about our relation to what we produce. And yes, I do think, I am still Marxist in that sense, I do think that matters, but I don't think it's the only thing we've lost. And I also don't think that we've entirely lost any of it. Like we've lost elements of this. This, is, this has become harder to, to do the way most people would probably do it if left alone. Um, but we still see plenty of these kind of social organization tendencies and trends emerging all the time. They are not 
and they emerge from everything from weird stuff around COVID to anytime we see a crisis, um, et cetera. I mean, that doesn't even get into the fact that I think when we talk about like gay luxury space communism with fully automated everything, that that assumes infinite energy um, and infinite soil productivity and infinite. And while I, I'm not a mouth, I'm not a Malthusian on population. Um, I'm not, but there is not infinite everything. Um, no, and th this is where an idea of kinship extending to the environment is extremely important. If you if you believe in Star Trek and space and you're anthropocentric and like you know the the capacity of the human mind is the thing that you really think is the best thing that has ever happened, and you know you, most of most of your bros probably feel like that, right? Like human exceptionalism, I think, is kind of like my, I automatically assume most people feel that way, that they would like rip open an orangutan rib cage every day if they needed that to give their kid medicine or whatever. Like, I, I think most people don't have any problem with the idea of a human life as being more valuable. The problem with that is that you are not just one species. You're like many, many microbes and also mites and amoebas and other things. You're an ecosystem, dude. And you are dependent on species that you can't name. And they do affect your ability to perceive and to cognate and they they make your tummy hurt and sometimes that influences whether or not you know what's real um and so like you you are yourself an ecosystem in a soup of other ecosystems interacting with each other and we are dependent on others on the bacterial load of the troposphere um <laughs> you know we're, we're dependent on these things that are outside of our ability to see and to measure and you know our best efforts as scientists to improve our measurement technologies are just now starting to like scratch the surface of exactly how many species we have been influenced by genetically and energetically over the course of our evolution. So um, I, I cannot think of humanity in the colonial, like the idea of leaving earth and going to a new planet and terraforming it and making it work for us. Like um, that, that idea depends on the idea that we don't have some kind of reciprocity with the soil and with the animals that we eat and the environments that create them too. And I'm saying this like as a scientist, and as soon as like, you know, and many indigenous activists talk like this when they talk about like reciprocity and kinship relationships with the environment, there are many world religions that have this perspective. But when you talk to people from weird societies and you talk like that, they're like, okay, put on your elephant pants. Let's all start drinking kombucha. Clearly this isn't going to solve any problems. Um, but we can't engineer ourselves out of problems that we don't understand. And there there are living things that are creating our environments that we need to understand better, that we, we, we can't necessarily simulate through our cognition and reduction. And, and that, that's another problem with how we approach, like, what are we gonna do moving forward? Because we can't just move forward with a revolutionary program in which the classes will suddenly, you know, that will, will form consciousness that allows us to advance and progress together towards a, a goal that's beneficial. Um, we're, we're actually, we're not even able to identify which people we see as being as human as us, or, you know, like we, we let alone extending a concept of kinship to the environment and to other species. So like we, we have a hard time with exclusion and inclusion and and kind of like lumping and splitting when it comes to families still and i think that like that's a big obstacle when you're trying to figure out how to overthrow a you know an entrenched hierarchy that has funneled the metabolic energy of the planet to a very small number of people in a very short period of time it's a pretty big it's a big problem to think could be solved through pamphlets alone and not through shared being and doing right like um 
And this one of my one of my very good friends, Amir Hernandez, is an astrophysicist and has written articles on Marx and is one of my favorite people to argue with about Hegel um, and things like that. But um, th that's one of the things that we actually talked about in terms of community building. Um, you know, the the unions and like Marxist organizations, they used to like have physical activities together, like they do right. sports clubs and other things like that. There was active integration and people doing things together, eating food together. Like that's that's where all of the organizing happened was around dinner tables. And um, I, I've done a lot of community organizing and the strategies that have always worked for the best for me have been like creating community integration through potlucks or community gardens, sites where right. people come together and do very wholesome things together. Um, and I, I don't see uh, Marxist podcasts in general these days or just anybody really advocating for those spaces for kinship integration and for social interaction like we, we just we we fundamentally change modes in terms of how we engage food and space and and we're all kind of like you know we're we're on our screens in our own rooms eating our microwave dinners and we're not we're not in a space solving problems which is kind of an interesting anthropological thing. There, there have been several stories about how um, in communities where a well is put in so that it can access fresh water. So like before all of the people in the village would have to walk many miles in order to get water in the morning. And when they did that, when they walked together, they would gossip and they would solve problems. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they would walk to go get the water. And by the time they came back, they had solutions. And when the well was put in the community, all of a sudden, um, you know, problems started popping up. There was more and more conflict because people weren't spending that time doing the social work. Um, I don't, I, I only really know academics and Marxists in general to kind of like draw lines in the sand <laughs> and say that you're not my kin and I won't work with you. Like I see, I see a lot of like conflict and adversarial interactions no matter what sphere I'm really trying to talk with people in about how we could like relate to or think about relatedness better um and and i think it's it, it really is there's like a fundamental lack of experience of insideness for a lot of people and that they they really need a granny to like yell at them and tell them to come inside and like they need to be inside on that to know what what they're gaining because i think um like when we talk about like the fully automatic luxury communism, when we talk about this like idea of enlightenment progression, there is a promise of what we will gain, right? Mm -hmm. Like, and it is, it is a utopia. It is a super cool blue robot body and like everything being all efficient and like Wally -E without the floaty chairs or whatever, Athens without slaves. It's, it's all kind of the same thing to me at this point because it's, it's a, it is a really nice story, but um, what, what's, what's lacking in that like narrative of what we'll gain is like what is lost in kinship, what's lost in biodiversity, what's lost in, in viability and resilience. Because if, if we have to engineer the planet all the time, if we have to have all these artificial institutions for managing people because kinship systems aren't managing them and caring for them and provisioning them, like we're, we're, we're not really seeing what we're losing. So we can't even form a vocabulary for what we would gain like in embodied wealth in satisfaction in cortisol reduction and, in, in you know, everything that matters to me. Um, <laughs> so I will pick that. Up. So Robert Sapowski and cortisol and It's interesting to me that I get a lot of pushback um, on a lot of these issues. I am not as explicit about it as, as probably you are. I still use a, a Marxist terminology, although increasingly I'm frustrated with that. We're trying to get people to expand or incorporate that. I can get them to realize, okay, yeah. You, know, you mentioned Amir. Um, as a side note, uh, I used to work for Amir's dad. Speaking of kinship, like we, we know yeah. each other, know his family. And, uh, um, and 
um, we were we were kind of going through a lot of the similar changes on this point at the same time where I was like, look, I, I'm you know, I'm a fairly orthodox Marxist, but there's all this stuff I learned in anthropology that this is not accounting for. When I read Marxist anthropology, that tends to be a mess. You mean um, like Marvin Harris, like Columbia School Marxist anthropology? Yes. Oh, the dirty stuff. You like it real vulgar. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty vulgar. And uh, it was not very um, satisfactory. And that's, I found around this time, I found um, Marshall Solomons's uh, Stone Age Economics, actually, his book from 1972, um, which really goes into substantive, substantivist economics versus formalist economics. And even that, he doesn't seem totally. Um, um, happy with the distinction, but he does point out that, like, look, you can't really separate culture, law, economics, society, even governance in a clear way before modern societies. And if we're honest, you probably can't really separate it in modern societies either, but we've convinced ourselves from the, from moment one that we can. Um, and that was, that was uh, really um, influential to me, and particularly with dropping this notion of progressive development. Well, what, and the reason why I had to drop it is I hit this wall because I was like, okay, we talk about technologies and we talk about how technologies are always optimized for the society that we're in. But we do not include seemingly irrational cognitive frameworks as part of that assumption that like, okay, why, do, why are most cultures animistic? All right. Um, is it because it's just a stage towards the, the truth of going through a singular God and even dropping that? Or is it because there's something about projecting personhood onto even things that is highly functional and stable for most human organization? And when I started thinking about that, I, I also at the same time was dealing with Samir Amin and him pointing out that like, well, Marxism has this here be dragons to most of human society, which it cast out as either Asiatic despotism or the Asiatic mode of production, whatever the hell that is. No one really knows. Um, our primitive accumulation forms because the modes there in Marx, there's really like hunter gatherers, Blah, blah, blah. Something, something. Roman Empire. We don't even know what to call that. Slave society, whatever. Blah, blah, blah. Capitalism. Uh, feudalism, too. But we don't really have a good definition for that, either. Um, capitalism is the only mode of production we know how to really talk about. And then, it, But there's been more modes. And admittedly, Marx mentioned modes of production twice and basically both in explanations and his, and his explanation and Engel's explanation seem to be the same. But if you actually look at the wording, they're not. Um, but you, you can't discount, even if you're dealing with Marx, that that is the assumption of Marxist. Uh, you, your, your point about the uh, linear developmentalism in Marx, uh, while, you know, uh, Kohei Sito, uh, Saito and, and company are trying to convince me that's not true. Um, my only counter argument is that until the 1960s, every Marxist I know of accepts that. After the 1960s, actually really kind of beginning in the 1950s, but after the 1960s for sure, everybody's trying to deny that's what the text says, even though while... Marx isn't necessarily always consistent on it. It is what the text says. They just completely... Okay, so 
after the 60s, that's when the GI Bill brought in this surge of white dudes into anthropology. And so like, okay, it's important to understand in the history of anthropology and most of the social and behavioral sciences, mm -hmm. it was being done by dandies from rich families and fancy outfits. They were literally the definition of armchair, right? They read a bunch of books. They argued in their lounges and their smoking jackets, and they had very little interactions with people at all. Lewis Henry Morgan was actually kind of different in that like for a lawyer he was like out interacting with indigenous peoples he had very messed up ideas about them that later in life he he ended up 180ing real hard on but the problem is that nobody ever remembers you for your 180 they only remember you for the dumb stuff you said first and i think that like marx is really like that too and on german ideology he he has this like super um <laughs> underminable trajectory of cultural development that he presents that it, it involves a description of primitive accumulation. Um, I think Engels does a little bit better in his text, but what they both really fail to account for is, is what you said, like it's the irrational stuff, it's ritual human sacrifice and witchcraft, which are very important parts of managing kinship relationships um, and are also things that social and behavioral scientists struggle to talk about because like it's hard to admit that slavery still exists on earth we call it modern slavery we call it human trafficking we have a bunch of different linguistic tools for kind of separating ourselves away from the fact that slavery is still real in some capacity and then a lot of the let's distinguish chattel slavery from human trafficking and other things like that is also a cope because there are people that are being bought and sold as assets in different places on the planet still, even though it's not legal anywhere. And I feel like um, some of the problems that like in order to accumulate, in order for classes to form, in order for elites to exist, those social stratifications are escalated and reinforced by ritual human sacrifice. And if you're interested in reading on this, I this is one of my favorite special interests. I've accumulated quite a lot of literature on it. But um, when a spread starts to form in a society, it can often be like ossified through sacrifice. And whatever that form takes, it can be in wasting, it can be in like a really gory public you know, like ripping open a rib cage or shooting someone full of arrows or whatever. There's there's lots of different ways that we use violence um, to, to reinforce the hierarchies that exist. And I think that you can make a fair case for the way that black men have been killed by police officers, that like they're, they're, we still are seeing people that are sacrificed in order to maintain social power now. Um, and, and it happens very systematically. So I think that, that that's an issue too. Like, we want to talk about these things in the terms of reason and cognition when some really creepy, uh, impulsive things are happening that have everything to do with like us versus them and the way that our ancestors were successful in their environment of evolutionary origin in forming ideas of us versus them. And then also run away by this training and, and the suppression of empathy and in, in not extending ideas of kinship, right? And not bringing people in to the us. Um, this is a big problem when it comes to the way that we approach genocides, because I think that like the Rwandan genocide um, in, in the fact that it was like if we look at the numbers is like proportionately more horrific than the Holocaust. Like it's, it's something that was supposed to never happen again and then happened again. Um, and so that kind of undermines the idea that genocide is an impossibility and all that it really takes is knowing how to manipulate language in order to make a person, another human who is extremely related to you. Like you have every reason to want them to thrive and survive as much as you. We're actually very close um, to make them in your mind, the equivalent of like a cockroach or an insect, right? Like that, that dehumanizing language and that dehumanizing strategy um, that's playing with the cognitive and parsing framework of kinship in, in the human mind. And it's, we need to know a lot more about perception and, personhood 
Um, if we're going to think that as social and behavioral sciences, we can contribute anything useful to the conversation of like how to make the world a better place or make it a place where genocide can happen. Because I think that they don't really want to talk about violence. They want to do the pinker. They, they want to hide behind the shield of statistics and be safe to know that like things are getting better. And all we have to do is keep plugging along with the Enlightenment Project and we'll be fine. Um, I'm, I'm personally not optimistic. <laughs> Nicholas Nassim Talib is not a guy that I would normally tell people to read, but his takedown of Pinker um, is brilliant. And it's just like, look, you're statistically whitewashing levels of relative violence because they happen in sporadic spurts uh, and then they die down again, usually because you can only maintain that level of violence for so long before something does kind of break the the spell of language but the spell of language is fucking real like um i i remember just you know i lived in korea uh, in korea for a long time and i i learned well a long time three years is not really a long time but long enough to learn the basics of the language and uh i have korean relatives um and so i do had some cultural ties to korea before i went there and I don't know. I don't I don't think this is good about me, but the longer I was there, the more I kind of hated the Japanese. Yeah. <laughs> like, um, and I don't have a really like, no one from Japan's ever done anything to me. I don't <laughs> You learned it through osmosis. You just right. absorbed it through your skin. And that's that's how that works, right? That's how the concept of social contagion is useful when it comes to very little other than the idea of us versus them. Because yeah. I think so, like when people that you have mutuality of being with, someone that like has moved their body and accomplished a task and you have been able to, through your parsing framework, put yourself in their position, mimic that activity and do it, right? Um, when humans have that kind of relationship with the way that we watch each other move and do things, we form special bonds. If it's reinforced, that's the neurological foundations of kinship. Um, so uh, it, it really is like, Primacy and recency and repetition creates legitimacy when it comes to like what actually makes people recognizable as kin neurologically. And um, if a person who is totally an us, if a few people that you're with identify them as a them, it's amazing how quickly disgust is activated, how quickly your limbic system gets hijacked and how permanently your judgment against that person is encoded. Um, and, and it's, it's, it's just wild, honestly, to talk about it. Yeah. It's one of these things where I was trying to explain this to, to someone, okay, you tell me about all this stuff about how economics can predict politics and to some degrees, you're kind of right. And that predicts voting patterns sort of, but you're going to have a hard time explaining why regions and age are far more predictive of voting patterns than economic class what um and the only real time we see class tying into it honestly is the elites in the area tend to vote class interest so you can kind of predict what elite interest is going to be um and downstream from that is downstream from that yes highly educated individuals tend to be you know of a certain political valence but I, I don't want to sound like a conservative, but they're, they're not totally wrong about this. That's also an exposure um, alliance program <laughs> in a lot of ways. Um, and and then this gets naturalized. I mean, I remember, you know, uh, the Jonathan hate disposition stuff that makes it seem like, well, liberal and conservative are somehow these trans historical values that are innate in our our, our psychology some way, blah, 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 blah. And I was like, okay, let's look at temperament sorters this way. And, and I remember him going, it's trans, you know, it's, it's, it's transcultural. And so I took his stupid test. Um, 
And one, I didn't actually fit their values patterns at all. In fact, my values patterns are apparently really weird. And two, um, I really don't have a disgust mechanism whatsoever, but I, I actually do value loyalty and familial loyalty, like obscenely more than a lot of people. Apparently, <laughs> Like I, I will probably shoot you over it. Um, not on pro violence, but I know that about myself to, to, to get back into your, your study. So you have that. And then you have this stuff. I mean, specifically genocide. One of the things I pointed out to people about genocide is like the genocide rules aren't really about predicting, uh, stopping genocide. The genocide rules are kind of about nations being able to do what the Western nations that came up with the genocide rules did to consolidate their own nation, national identities. Sorry, that's really what that's about. They don't. The they might even have business. Yeah. <laughs> right. Like it's just like you can't. You guys can't do that because it's bad. Even though we all did it. Let's list the things we did: force language, force labor, deliberately break up familiar contexts. Uh, you know, all the stuff that you see thrown at say China about the Uyghurs, which that stuff is really, with the exception of probably the mass death. I don't actually see a lot of evidence for that. But that stuff is really happening there. But that definition of genocide is like deliberately political. Does it stop actual murders of, of huge groups of other people based on ethnic lines? No, no. Not at all. And are ethnic lines even really that clear? Not Hell really. No. <laughs> <laughs> like, no. Um, well, this is the problem with people who are composite sites, right? Like ethnic lines aren't clear when you are claimed by multiple people and you also claim multiple lines of people. Um, and, and there's also a value to that that is not just economic. And th this is just a point that I wanted to make about what, what you're saying. Um, if you do the math on colonialism, it's not economically justifiable. Unless you also account for uh, sadism and all of the pleasure that people derived from being absolute monsters. And it, it's the same sort of thing. Like people pay in, in, in studies where there is neurological imaging done about people's intentions, um, people pay to punish other people. You know, they, they go out of their way to do things that are spiteful and mean and do not fall under the umbrella of what we would call, you know, a, an economic rationalization. So if you like, we can't explain the history of humanity. We can't explain like the Neolithic revolution and the advent of agriculture as just like people making these rational decisions when we exist in a world in which we watch people believing in math like if COVID, like how can people argue for a world in which like rational thinking dominates when they saw everybody believe in magic during covid and do the whole horse paste thing and do all of the rituals and like you know it's it's just kind of amazing to watch so much um, religion and the supernatural exist in the modern world and try to plan for how we'll get to a world that we actually want to live in without accounting for it. It's like, I have to think about the people who believe in magic and I have to think about the engineers because I, I consider both of them obstacles to a viable planet, but yeah, how too. exactly we approach that. Um, I have to think about it in terms of like, expanding the circle of kinship and figuring out how to integrate people. How do we integrate people back into families when their entire development and socialization has been pushing them farther and farther from anything that could be inside more and more into isolation? I don't know how to deal with that problem. Um, but I think and isolation about is a conservatizing and aggressivizing factor. I mean, like, yeah. One of the things that there's two things that I always talk about, like we, we have examples of relatively egalitarian power, egalitarian societies, like a particularly immediate, immediate return hunter gatherers being the, the big one. I am interested in some of the examples David, David Graeber gives in uh, the history of everything. I'm I'm not sure I believe them all. I'm going to have to do more research, um, but I, but but I don't think the only form of egalitarian society. But I actually do think that, and I have some friends of mine that really push back on Graeber on this, uh, 
uh, but he's got a point about having the offsite this hierarchy and aggression somewhere, like and and that doing it symbolically um, is is fairly effective, and the, and that uh, egalitarian societies, just as much as hierarchical societies, actually do have to enforce it. Like both oh, yeah. those systems require frankly, violent reinforcement. Yeah, that, so. that's my favorite thing to talk about when people think that egalitarian is the Rousseau noble savage where everybody's just eating berries, chilling in the sunlight. Nobody's fighting over where the rocks are. It's hilarious because like um, hunter gatherers that intentionally suppress hierarchy, let's say like, let's say you're like the best hunter and you just killed this extremely beautiful animal and you bring it into everybody. Um, instead of you getting too big for your britches and thinking, wow, I'm a big provider. Look at everything that I just did for my community. All of the grannies will come and be like, mm, this tastes like you pierced the intestines, did some did, did some stomach juice and some, you know, did some bile pour out on this. This tastes rancid. And they'll just neg it the entire time they're eating it. Right. So there is an extraordinary amount of negativity <laughs> and, and violence necessary in order to suppress hierarchies and to stop them from forming. So it's really, the question isn't whether or not we're like a peaceful fertility cult or like a murderous death cult. It's how do we oscillate between being supportive and integrating and putting people in their place through violence in order to like, in order to provision offspring the best. And this is where we get into the idea of like gerontocracy as opposed to neontocracy, right? So like anthropologists love triangles. This is another reason that you should be extremely um, suspicious of them because anything that can be easily turned into a diagram involving a triangle probably should be questioned. But um, they, they like to think of the idea of like, if all of the children in the society are basically worthless, but the ancestors are very valuable, if there are a small number of old men at the top of your society, that's a gerontocracy, right? It's where the geriatrics get all of the energy and investment, all the best stuff flows to them. And then a neontocracy would be the opposite, where all of the grandparents and all of the adults and all of the community members all give all of their energy to one little baby and they make sure that that baby is provisioned and they are considered where the ancestors are seated, right? Like often babies are viewed as reincarnated ancestors in these neontocracies. And um, like in, in the anthropological literature, there's, there's actually this one guy, Lancey. I think he's important, but he annoys me because he says that... Uh, weird societies have neontocracies now because we have a small number of ch children and invest in them heavily. Um, my, my problem with that is in these situations, the children are in the arena of competitive parenting and there's like mimetic rivalry and um, trophy uh, like presentation of children that's involved in all this. So I think, I think he's wrong. I think it's actually like evidence of return on investment in, in Western and indu uh, educated industrialized rich democracies. But I do think it's important to think about how an indigenous culture would use negativity and violence socially for the benefit of children, as opposed to um, using children as lubricant for like the wheels of an empire, which is I think what we, we see much more commonly when we look in the archeological record and the roles of children historically. So I think, I think that's another like framework that people who come from the Marxist social sciences, like I, my professor, Chris Kyle was a student of Marvin Harris. So he was like, Marx was my genealogy and anthropology. And it was like the GI bill involved all of these guys coming into anthropology outside of these like elite families and they started really focusing on materialism as opposed to idealism, because I think that they were really, they were pushing back against conservative Christianity after they'd gone to war during World War II and had seen other cultures and may, maybe they had slightly different ideas. Um, but they, they did really lean onto this idea that everything could be explained through material conditions. And, and the reality is that like the social conditions are often created through violence and that violence doesn't have to be rooted in 
material objects. It, it, it can Social control can take a lot of different forms. I think it's just really important to keep that in mind. Yeah. I, you know, you and I are both interested in primate studies. That's, that's part of the anthropology stuff that I'm interested in. that makes people uncomfortable. And I actually got really pissed at David Graeber for like implying that anyone who would compare primitive, which I think that's offensive, but primitive cultures to primates was insulting primitive cultures. And I'm like, you're assuming that I don't see primates as on the same spectrum as us. Like that's the problem, right? Like, like, um, like, the uh, like Sapolsky, Franz Duval, Jane Goodall, mm -hmm. like they, they truly extend the concept of personhood to primates. Right. And uh, there, there are other primatologists within anthropology that don't, they do not have that concept of personhood. And, um, it's really like uh, Tomasello, right? Like Tomasello kind of is cited by Salins, actually, even though I don't, I don't agree with Tomasello as much as DeWall. I'm, I'm very much like a DeWall school of empathy and personhood. But yeah, there's this idea that like um, by saying that humans and primates have similar structures, we are saying some humans are less than. That anthrop anthropocentric idea is, like it's super enlightenment. It, it, you, it's great chain of being Aristotle stuff. That's just like inextractable from, from modernity, from everything. Like I haven't, I haven't had a single professor that didn't have that belief. Like, and even when they were like talking about um, like network theory and like the cybernetic ideas around ecosystems and other things like that they they were still happily like chomping on the barbecued chicken and talking about how we're gonna have to do lab grown meat because they're not giving it up so it's like the, the, their concept of like kinship and integration doesn't extend far enough to actually change how any of them live or act or like consider the feelings of of, of animals or other living things so no and then i think that that's a big problem with with academia in the west in general yeah, I was yeah. I, I was actually surprised that Graeber did that. I was, uh, um, but if Solins restrains Graeber, apparently David Wingro just gave him more crack. Yeah, but, um, absolutely. They, they um, start off with the Hobbes and Rousseau binary, and it's like, oh come on, guys. And uh, but but uh, we're gonna. I can't wait to actually read that book. I really hope that you're able to to come with us when we do it. Because I want to go through all of the citations and just his strategy of pulling from dozens of ethnographic examples to like form his argument. It just it, it's there. There's problems with that kind of Frankenstein's ethnography that like I, I like what he's trying to say. I actually like how he does bibliography, but I just I don't come to the same conclusions. I can't agree with the synthesis, but I'm glad I'm always glad that he challenged the kind of like typical narrative within academia. I think it's good to be a contrarian in anthropology. There are just probably more constructive ways uh, to have done it, um, especially. Yeah. Uh, do you know do you know about David Price, actually? Yeah, I do. Okay, so the weaponizing anthropology is probably, if you're going to touch on one text in order to kind of orient it, that's good. But then there's also the Network for Concerned Anthropologists, the Counter Counter Insurgency um, field book, I believe is the full title. But it, it's just about the history of anthropology being used by governments, by the military, by businesses um, to exploit and to take advantage of indigenous peoples, to displace them. Um, all, all of the ways in which anthropology has been the social worker in the colonial cop relationship, basically how anthropology from the Jesuits until now has facilitated a lot of really awful assimilation behaviors. Um, and I think the people who are interested, who, people who want to say that anthropology is like the best department in the academy um, I think they need to read, they need to read David Price because um, he does not like his colleagues. <laughs> and I think that that's, that, that's useful to, to put into context is like a lot of these people don't really care about cultural relativism or the preservation of culture. They're just very happy to have tenure and to not have to work in a mine. Yeah. Don't blame it for not working on the mine, but you are, you are, uh, 
you're you're not wrong. I, I remember the first time I was ever actually tr tempted by an anthropology scholarship, and it was actually read by the intelligence agencies in the United States. Yeah. So, so um, seen that in real time. Learning Arabic in the early 2000s was like heavily subsidized by the US government. And I knew Absolutely. a lot of people in anthropology who they're totally boo lickers. They, 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 like they, they violated the fundamental principles of not being a douche. And I think that that's actually kind of like interesting. Um, like that trajectory of Marxist academic to government informant. It's, it's, it's not a thin pipeline. It, it has no. been well traveled. <laughs> yeah. um, well, on that note, uh, we have to end. I could talk to you about this stuff all day. Um, weirdly for a vaguely socialist podcast, we do have to plug. Um, so what, what would you like to plug? So I'm an organizer at the member school, and this is where I'm able to actually talk about my interests in ritual human sacrifice, uh, horse war, and basically all of the ways in which everything that you've been taught is a lie. Um, we, we spend a lot of time dealing with these ideas of personhood, but then also exactly at what point we could have said no. In our history, I think that there's we have a very Tom Stoppard, Rosencrantz, and Gilderstern energy about everything. Like if there was a point at which we could have personally made different choices in order to subvert these institutions, it happened before the play started. So um, that's that's what we're looking for is, is that kind of moment. And it's a wonderful group of scholars. We have people from all over who specialize in everything. Um, we just had a class on the history of gold rushes and mining with Duncan Money, who's a fantastic independent scholar. Um, we're doing what is blackness right now and reading Fana and really exploring um, kind of black studies and Afro pessimism. So it's a great community of learners. And if you like reading books and you like arguing, then that might be a place where <laughs> you would be welcome. So that I think it'd be interesting if, if anybody who listens to your podcast comes into the discord and kind of sees what we're talking about, because it's, it's a lot of what you and I talked about here. Yeah, it is. And in, in more detail and kind of contentiously. Um, well, thank <laughs> you. So, thank you so much. I hope you have a great rest of your day. Oh, you too. Bye-bye.